fucking tweets from Atlanta. Like, mm-hmm. that's, yeah, I think you're right. Like, frankly, I think improv and comedy might be the very last bastion of safety from algorithmic generated stuff because like that'll be the last thing the machines learn is how to make people laugh i think yeah well they because a buddy of mine ran um he he ran right he he would he went to the uh was it chat gpt Mm -hmm. and he he typed in um do a joke about dating in the style of martin morrow and he 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 sent that he sent out what it you know what it said to me and i was like this is terrible it might is it is, is it is this <laughs> does this mean that i am <laughs> not funny or that ai has not yet captured humor so it just thinks like joking is talking a lot well i'm gonna leave that an open question well i welcome everybody to ai affected uh the show about algorithms and machine learning and how they're affecting our lives and our relationships and our work very excited to introduce today's guest. He is an actor, a comedian, a writer, a Second City uh, touring company ensemble member. Uh, you've seen his face in a million national commercials. He looks like your friendly accountant or insurance agent <laughs> and uh, one of my favorite humans. Please welcome Martin Morrow. Hey, Russ. Good to see you. Thanks for coming in, man. Thank you. And you're also one of my favorite humans. Oh, good. I'm going to start calling this the Favorite Humans podcast because... <laughs> <laughs> Who knows if we're going to talk about AI, but at least you're here, so thank yeah, you. Thank you. Um, yeah, so we were just talking about how you work in social media, mm-hmm. and so uh, the analogy when I was thinking about this last night was like that movie, The Hurt Locker, Yeah, where it's it's like, it's almost as if you can do more harm quickly by doing the wrong thing in social media then you can help a brand by doing the right thing in social media. (laughs) So like how as a professional who like gets hired to do this, how much of it is like uh, the hands off approach so you don't blow anything up as opposed to the actually trying to like cultivate and build a following and stuff like that. Well, you know, it's, it's funny because a lot of it, there's so many different levels and, especially where I just left, but it was always like, there's the creative director, and then there's the the head of this, and then there's this person, and then there's these people who have to look at this, and then and then you're at the bottom writing everything, and then they all just kind of like, mm-hmm. we did, we helped with that, sort of, and uh, <laughs> so... Is, is the help that they're like punching it up and making it funny, or is it just they're there to make sure that it's not going to offend any of the executives and that kind of stuff? A lot of it is trying to not offend executives. Uh, if it's entertainment, you don't want to offend the actors. Uh, you like the on one project, like the director was very uh, heavily involved, and we had released an image of two of the main characters that kind of spoiled the, the entire movie. And he was like, "Hey, you guys just spoiled the movie. Uh, can you take that down?" And we we're mm-hmm. like, "Ah." Oh, yeah, I get it. but then it has to go back through this chain of command of like, oh, do we have to tell this, oh, tell this person, that kind mm-hmm. of thing. Um, so it, there's so many, I feel like there's so many checks and balances that it, it really takes a lot of people to be stupid to, <laughs> to mess up something uh, in, in that caliber, or it's intentional of like, uh, like what was the, the Burger King tweet of, uh, women, women belong in the kitchen. That the oh, Burger King yeah. UK, yeah, amazing, yeah. Um, and I don't even. Here's the other thing. I don't know if that's a real tweet that happened, but we saw it, and mm-hmm. people still bring it up. It was a campaign, in a, anyway. Yeah, whether it was actually tweeted out by some crazy mad lad social media <laughs> guy or not. Yeah, um, yeah. I had a similar experience. I was doing social media for an app. That was a small, like, regional car sharing app in, like, San Francisco, Mm -hmm. but it was owned by AAA. So the mothership was this gigantic entity that, even though it wasn't representing itself as AAA, it was still, like, we have 50 million members of these just old folks who subscribe and just send in their check every year and don't want to think about it. And the last thing they want is to awaken people to something offensive that came out of social media (laughs) from this car sharing (laughs) app that's trying to be a little bit more edgy because it's, you know, aiming toward a younger demographic than, like, AAA members. Um, But, yeah, that had... Every email had to be checked by, like, eight people and had to go up and down the chain before you could get a word out and... uh, 
wrestling with the tone was really hard too of like we want to be snarky but not too snarky you know yeah every wanna... everything now is we want to be x but not too yz and you're like well if you're if you're going to be x then you're going to hit the line of y and z so it it's it's really like i honestly think if you eliminated three out of the 10 people on every totem pole that that in between squad you mm-hmm. would have the better product and the better you know social media and the better kind of uh, output but they don't want to do that because then who then then who's going to talk to this guy in this email right there's only one guy that can talk to the mid-level manager before it goes <laughs> back to the home office um in all honesty though i think that the current macroeconomic situation that we're in might just be <clears throat> killing off those three people on the totem pole like just via the momentum of all of the 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 wipeouts in tech right now yeah it's like everybody has to look at their position and be like what do you do you send the composed tweet from the that's already edited to the next guy and that's like that's your whole job he's like yeah but he doesn't know how to use twitter so i have to email him all the tweets so yeah makes sense it's, a, it's it's weird when you I, – because I, I, I feel like if you ever get to the actual top of whatever company that's doing, you know, uh, brand to brand or doing, you know, any any type of social media, you find out it's just like a, a blob that has a stick and it's like, well, that looks good. <laughs> and please send that out. So your visual of the, like, final approval is basically – Job of the Hut, <laughs> yes. Job of the Hut with a with half of a broomstick. <clears throat> he makes all of the decisions on tone. <laughs> <laughs> that might come off racist. <laughs> um, which what? emoji skin should we use? That kind of thing. Is that a big a bone of contention too? It it is. It it very much depends because like what sh- like literally what shade of thumbs up do you use in posts? Yeah. Is it the yellow kind of like? <clears throat> excuse me like the homer simpson-esque so it's not like a real race <laughs> or is it like <laughs> closer to what the people tweeting look like or how did they decide that so the the general uh it, it, a lot of it depends on the voice and the branding so the general mm-hmm. rule of thumb would be use the yellow one because it's like it's it there's no way that anybody could be mad about this kind of mm-hmm. n- regular thing except perhaps for the jaundiced people out there mm. yeah yeah shout out to the jaundiced the yellow the, yeah, people, yeah community <laughs> um, and uh and then like there are a couple of couple where it was like okay well we use the brown hand or the black hand because it's supposed to be a black lady and then mm-hmm. it'll be like me typing it or whatever or you find out oh it's this white lady who actually tweets this out so she's using the brown hand and is like like e- even the this this movie that i worked on recently um where we we had uh where we had to like kind of create the social media voice and tone for it. It was like a, it was like an all Asian female uh, movie. Mm-hmm. I could see how they would be ultra sensitive about trying to like match the skin tone to the thumbs up emoji yeah. for that. Because they're like, what color thumbs up do we use for the Asian one and all that stuff? Yeah, yeah. And but I think additionally, it was because uh, the person that they put put in charge of a lot of the stuff was mm-hmm. like no it should be more like yeah bitches and so she would so my stuff felt more grounded and more real and she was like no we want it exciting with bitches at the end of everything mm-hmm. so she would just at so she would like go back and change my stuff and would put like bitches or like a big cuss because like a lot of the brands are like i mean you can cuss but don't don't go overboard. And I'm mm-hmm. like, you're just adding bitches to everything. That's not add. <laughs> that doesn't change the dynamic of it at how all. Do, how do I get that job? That's a good one. <laughs> the, the comma bitches job. Yeah, and- <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I bitch things up professionally. Um, okay, so that this is really interesting that we're talking about like proper use of emojis because I feel like I'm trying to think of a, a meta analogy for what social media is as somebody who lives and swims in those waters like it almost seems like it doesn't quite have a real parallel to anything that's happened beforehand in human history it's not like a bunch of monks passing pamphlets around that they just printed out on a printing press because it's kind of like 
it's almost like the written word is becoming like obsolete before our eyes and we're going back to like hieroglyphs or something like that. Yeah. Because everything is images and symbols more so than the words. Yeah. Well, and, and I think additionally, like words matter, but they matter more so in a um, caption sense. Mm-hmm. So the visual is the most important part, but it's now it's like, okay, well, what if someone's watching this while they are on the train? How do we effectively do it to where they don't have to listen anymore they can just see the things and then and then you want to again like because a lot of like cuss words get flagged Mm -hmm. in in a lot of uh videos and so that because everyone's looking at how do i get this monetized how do i get this push to the top of the algorithm or whatever whatever Mm -hmm. and it seems like the most kind of base level thing is if you advertise to kids but also to people who uh, might want to make fun of this thing for kids and you have it to where they can watch it on mute. So it's just like this kind of weird constant of how do we how do we get everything in that would make the most money but offend no one? Yeah, and I mean, do you, like, are you locking comments ever? Do you ever put out things where people can't respond to because you're worried about trolls and things like that? Or is it just you hope for engagement, good or bad, and it's all good? You, you usually hope for engagement, good or bad. Mm-hmm. And then, um, so like the, there was one movie I worked on recently uh, in the social media sphere. And it, it looks like, it, it's not, it wasn't a great movie. Okay. Uh, and it, it hasn't come out yet, but it, it's not gonna, I don't think it's, people aren't gonna be like, this is the next, mm-hmm. you know, Goodfellas or whatever. Um, I like the the anti promotional nature of, of what you're doing on the podcast. <laughs> this is the opposite of every podcast in the world. To be like, this is a movie I worked on. Don't see it. It's not good. <laughs> We're going to talk about it as an example, but it's really don't spend your time or money. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm being cautious with not saying the name of it. Um, but it was. Uh, we even like went in with the kind of knowledge of oh this might not be a good uh good movie but we we're gonna release a trailer and hope for the best and then the the response to the trailer was like okay this looks corny but like fun like like i'll take my aunt to see this or whatever Mm -hmm. you're like okay well that at least is a good kind of middle ground Mm -hmm. of uh is this like the new medea movie or something like that no i'm not gonna (laughs) no i'm not gonna say it (laughs) whatever it is i'll stop try probing (laughs) Yeah, but but yeah, that was. Um, I, I think that oftentimes we 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 hope for the best, but we know like because you know if you watch a movie in advance, you're gonna you you already see the the flaws beyond the the, the creative flaws. I think will always take over more than the technical ones. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I want to push my uh, my hieroglyphs analogy a little bit further. Mm-hmm. So you deal with the written word all the time, like not just social media, but you're a writer and you're a comedian. Right. And when you're doing stand up, you're performing your written material to the audience. Do you think that there's a future where somehow the fact that people are being conditioned to use written language less and symbols more is somehow going to bleed into stand up comedy and like all these traditional art forms that we do? Um, I, I don't want to say that it doesn't have the potential because we we've seen we've seen everything regress. Mm-hmm. We've seen uh, we've seen everything evolve. Like you know, there. If, if I went back in time and was like, "Tinder's weird," they'd be like, well, "What do you fire? What are you talking about?" Mm-hmm. Um, so I I think anything is possible. I and I, th- I think especially like when pandemic comedy was happening, I think that was a very kind of telltale sign of of the potential of. Uh, of a lot of that stuff. When you say pandemic comedy, do you mean like Zoom shows or what are you talking about? Zoom shows, uh, how, how that kind of evolved into, you know, you'd see like how the thumbs up emoji or like people, a lot of people did like Instagram, um, like Instagram live shows or whatever. Mm -hmm. So seeing like a fire emoji or a laugh emoji, a bunch of laugh emojis, uh, clubhouse is another app that kind of had a lot of that Mm -hmm. as well. Like, Oh, if you, if you see these emojis pop up, that's a good thing. We want more of that kind of engagement. Oh, and in your brain, you're trying to replace that stuff with what normally would be laughter that you can experience in real time instead of seeing a bunch of, fires and check marks and 100s and stuff coming across the screen yeah oh man how do you deal with that in real time doing zoom stand up and trying to give like take that as the feedback you're getting from the audience 
I, I think a lot of it is <clears throat> trying to look at it as some form of growth, uh, audience growth. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, like, I would always try to, hey, follow me on Instagram or this, that, the third. And I, I think if if anything, in hindsight, I wish I would have pushed to do more TikToks during that time because now mm-hmm. that's the thing. But at that time, I would look at TikTok and it looked like it was just children and really weird old dudes. And I was like, oh, well, who would be on this thing? And then it becomes the number one app. So Yeah, it seems like a, a lot of the – a few comedians that I've seen like recently trending, like they're good – but a lot of their success has to do with like being obsessed with the right format to share their videos online. Like yeah. uh, Stavros Halkias comes to mind because he was like this total nerdy dude from Baltimore. And like, granted, he obviously put the work in, did a million shows. Mm-hmm. And his thing was that he spent a lot of time recording himself um, doing crowd work, riffing with the audience. And those went viral because he would make the Instagram story. And like you said, it would have the perfect captions on it. So you could scroll by it. And he'd be like, Stavros, uh, Stavi destroys this guy who's a middle manager and tells him that his, you know, his life is not meaningful or something like that. <laughs> and those would all go viral because he would just go around asking people what they did. And he was pretty quick on the trigger. And so he would be like, yeah, you don't have a real job or something. Like that. And those would, those would go mass. As, as opposed to his written material, which is... Good, but not nearly as popular as him just making fun of people in the audience on Instagram Live and stuff like that. Yeah, I, I think people are finding that they can make more money online than uh, than doing. And in some cases, it does translate to you know ticket sales, but it's it's also a matter of like, look, there there is a time where Carlos Mencia was selling out arenas, and now he's you know he's doing he's probably on shows with me, mm-hmm. so. <laughs> so uh, so yeah, you know, you never really, and that, no, no diss to Carlos Mencia. I, I don't know, but yeah. he helped to launch like Joe Rogan's popularity and he didn't somehow get to grab onto the coattails along the way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I have a rival podcast where <laughs> <laughs> invites the opposite of a Joe Rogan guest or something. Mencia like that. versus Rogan. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. yeah. I would do that. Um, so we were talking before about how you, um, have considered yourself like, the canceled whisperer, like somebody <laughs> who helps people out who've run into this kind of backlash online. Yeah. Um, I want to read you a couple of quotes of your, your medium uh, article authorship. Cool. And you just tell me your, your feedback on, on what this means to you. I mean, you wrote it, but yeah. what, what it means to you. <laughs> Uh, it feels like we've become poisoned to the unnecessary to the point where we create the havoc that we need to see. Yeah. What does that mean? Uh, I, I think that... So there there used to be a time where, like, if you read an article that said, guy saves, burn, guy saves babies from burning building, mm-hmm. it would just be, oh, my God, I'm glad that this guy saved these babies. That's beautiful, right? Mm-hmm. And then, and then that, that gets to run for a month, right? But now it's a thing of if you read Guy Saves Babies from Burning Building, your first reaction is, well, what was he like in eighth grade, right? What was this guy? I feel like he did something problem, something about him. I don't trust. I don't like that guy. And then one person just pops up like, yeah, I knew him in college and he was an asshole to me or whatever. And then and then it becomes a thing of, yeah, I heard he's an asshole. And, and how do you pile on to kind of diminish the the voice or the, the light or the whatever mm-hmm. uh, of this story and of this person. Like there was the, the one a uh, few years ago where there was a kid who was getting bullied and um, they had uh, taken a video of him like saying he wanted to kill himself. I think he had dwarfism or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and people reached out to him, celebrities and Marvel people. We want him to come to the red carpet and da 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 And then someone else just released an image of like, no, here's that kid partying. It's an actual adult. And and then and then like think someone eventually uh managed to kind of shut that down, but like not really. Like mm-hmm. if something it's it's almost like a gas leak when you so we we all lose our minds in this in this collective moment of, well, that's the bad guy. We all need we need the villain. That's our villain for today. Mm-hmm. Uh instead of 
one realizing like at any moment we could all be the villain of twitter or instagram or our community or you know the 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 apartment complex whatever like it, yeah. it can, everyone is a villain to somebody in their life yeah probably or, yeah or you're not or you're not living right you mm-hmm. know <laughs> So, yeah, I, I think a lot of it is we create our own kind of chaos because we try to create our own villain, but we try to do this every single day. And I think a lot of that also comes from the fact that we didn't confront whatever, quote unquote, villain or bad guy we have in our past. So mm. when we when we don't, uh, when we're not able to say, fuck you to, you know, the uncle that touched me or whatever, mm-hmm. you, you put it off on, like, some dude who you do improv with because he, like, said he likes butts or whatever. So mm-hmm. it becomes like, well, where's my power now? It's it's a lot of it. Have you you've heard, like, the the whole thing of, like, oh, people who weren't – people who got bullied end up becoming bullies? Yeah. It's a lot like that. Yeah, 100%. Um, that's really interesting. So a few shows ago – I had my buddy Patrick on, who's like a dating expert, and he was talking about kink. And he was saying, and we talked about how a lot of this stuff comes from these early childhood traumas, usually traumas or, or strange experiences. And then the adult is left with this thing that they're trying to feel okay about and trying to incorporate it into like a healthy sexual relationship, despite the fact that it was born out of trauma. Mm. Um, do you think this is a similar phenomenon where it's like somebody experienced a trauma and then they're going around trying to what they feel like is maybe save other people from a similar trauma, but really they're becoming this crusader and like trying to, you know, burn down houses and destroy lives in the, in the hope that they can like reverse this thing that happened to them kind of thing. Yeah, I I do. I think, I think a lot of it is, I, I think it's, I think it's two part. I think a lot of it does come from past trauma uh, or past um, elements of like, well, my parents raised me this way and I want to break out from that. But then you end up falling in even harder with the, not not essentially the idea of what your parents or, you know, whoever raised you, guardians, uh, but you fall in more with <clears throat> the kind of conceptualization of what they were about. So if it, mm-hmm. if it was like, well... I'm very Christian-y, I love Jesus, I love God, and then you break out of the church, and then you become, I love this community, and I'll do anything for this community, and this community is my new God, right? Mm-hmm. It becomes that. I, and I, I think that that is kind of the second part of that, because people are, everyone wants to look like the good guy. They want to be like, I'm the hero of this story, or whatever. But it's like, that's... When you when you when you tr- when you try so hard to become the hero of every tale, mm-hmm. you end up... Uh, you end up creating your own villain. You end up in, in being the villain as well. Okay, so I want to separate those two things out because those are, I think, two different phenomena. So one of them is this trying to become the hero because you, you genuinely had some trauma that you're trying to heal the world of and then maybe you'll go out and cause a bunch of harm because you're a little overzealous in trying to do this. Yeah. And then the other phenomenon is the wanting to project some kind of savior thing to the rest of the community. Like, how much overlap? Is is everything just both of those? Is it that I genuinely want to do good, but then I become corrupted by my narcissistic need for feedback of people telling me that I'm doing good? Or is it there are good actors who go wrong and who are trying to save people, and then there are just bad actors who are there for attention? And, like, how much is one and how much is the other? Um, I, I, I would almost feel like it's a definite, like, half and half. Mm-hmm. Um. I think that, and we we've we've definitely seen it before of people who do some shady shit and then they uh, become this. It becomes like a super response of how do I cover this up? Oh, if I do mm. the most good thing of all mm. time forever and ever, and also call attention to everyone else's shady shit, then you then no one's going to look at me because mm. I've been the the good guy the whole time. I've been mm-hmm. I've been Superman. Like if super, this is this yeah. is the the virtue signaling smoke bomb that the ninja throws <laughs> down and smashes on the floor and they disappear in their uh, in their glory. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. <laughs> and and you know, we we know people like that. Yeah. Um I also wanted to ask you So it seems like, you know, you could argue that People have been throwing each other under the bus for their own political motives through time and memoriam. Like, that's what Machiavelli wrote about. Mm-hmm. The Scarlet Letter is about everyone, 
you know, being really mean to this lady because of something that she did in somebody else's private life and make her wear the letter A and all that stuff. How much of this stuff that we're talking about is just human nature and how much of it has been like magnified or warped by, you know, the filter bubbles and the algorithms of social media? Um, I, I think that everything kind of uh, modernizes over time. Everything kind of uh, solidifies itself in the realm of today. So we, we aren't... We aren't doing anything new. This isn't like a reinvention of the wheel, you know. Uh, it, it's, it's funny because every time the subject of like cancel culture or call out culture or whatever you want to uh, toxicity, this, that, third, whatever. Every time it gets kind of mentioned, someone's like, well, what about the the women who were involved in the Salem witch trials and the witch hunt? This, you know, that kind of thing, right? Mm-hmm. And, they, and I think a lot of people, when you say that, you... you give a very broad generalization of what happened during the Salem witch trials. Like their idea of it, again, because a, a lot of these people, when you, when you join that type of mob mentality and I've been a part of it, I've definitely like been like, yeah, get him Right. <laughs> it's, Cause it's easier. It's mm-hmm. easier. And that's literally what the Salem witch trials were. They weren't what we, you know, like what was the, my, my sisters, my ancestors are the, the women who burned at the stake for blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. It's like, no, these were, it was men and women, or I'll say women and men because it was majority women. Mm-hmm. And they were, they were like outcasts or weird or like some dude uh, wanted to divorce his wife or mm-hmm. this guy was too quiet or whatever. Like, yeah. so they, so it, be, it was more of a thing of, well, we don't like these people who are different than us or these people who are weird or these people who are trying to get a divorce. So clearly, so, like a demon got a hold of them. Mm-hmm. And then you take one person's like kind of innocuous story and you match magnify that right same with uh the like when when in, when hollywood was like who's a communist and everyone freaked out and they blacklisted all these like actors and stuff right but mm-hmm. that was that was that era's version so i think we're well this seems to me like a pretty close parallel to that where everyone yeah. and you see this also in like in East Germany, post-World War II, there was, like, the Stasi, which was the secret East German police that would listen to everybody's phone conversations. And so mm. everyone is constantly trying to get their rivals in trouble with the Stasi by, like, setting them up, having phone calls with them because they know everything's being uh, surveilled. Mm-hmm. So it does seem like you're making the argument that this is just us and this is just how people throw each other under the bus to get ahead in the world. Yeah. But... I, I would, is it is it just that the incentives of social media have warped it so much that now just everybody feels like they have to participate in this kind of system, this uh, this slaughterhouse online, or what? I think so. I think we because it well, it, and even going back to all that, it used to be just throw someone under the bus, right? Mm-hmm. But now it's more of a thing because of the power of social media and because it's so instant. Um, we we are able to. We, we, it's not enough to just throw someone on the bus. You want to build the bus. You want to learn the training manual for the bus. You want to be able to drive the bus and park it in front of their house and then find that dude, throw him under it. You want to make sure people are on the bus but, so they can see you throw them under it, right? Um, so it's, it's, and, and it's, always, it's always weirder when it's like someone who's not directly involved, which I think we see a lot more now. Uh, or again, if it's a, a situation that's not directly related to xyz and we present it like well i've heard he's also a racist like where did that come from we were talking about you know whatever Mm -hmm. um so yeah i i i think that the amplification of it is again wanting to be a part of something so if you if if we go outside and see like 10 people walking with like torches our you know our, our immediate response is you know what why are they walking with torches? And then, and then we see them set like a like a giant monster. Like let's say it's like a a, a Frankenstein's monster, <laughs> and we see him like he's curled up in a ball. We see him get set on fire. Mm-hmm. We're like whoa, whoa! Why are they setting this creature on fire? And then if they all turn their heads and look at us, like wait, you don't think you don't think we should set this monster on fire? Uh, and they're like, no, I I do. And then we end up grabbing a torch and setting it on fire as well because that becomes kind of the uh, the, the the thing that feels more habitual because we don't want to get set on fire. Oh man, I'm so glad I did my homework because another one of my quotes is something that you're summarizing right now, which is, this is from your piece, quote, so you've been canceled. You write, if you're a part of the mob and stop and say, hey, let's think about this, you risk the mob turning on you. Yeah. So 
I mean, and and especially in Los Angeles, but I'm sure this happens everywhere. Mm-hmm. It seems like, especially in Los Angeles, people want to keep their heads down in general. They don't want to stick their head up. They don't want to take a stray bullet. So for the most part, if they can hide within a community that has like a relatively safe opinion, they will do it. Even if they don't 100% agree with it, even if it might rub them the wrong way, they're like, why would I make trouble when I'm trying to be cast for X, Y, and Z, and I'm trying to get friends to invite me on their improv shows or whatever? Like, why would I step out of line? Um, My own personal point of view is like... We, it may be self-destructively so is like weirdly the opposite of that mm-hmm. and it goes back to my family experience which was to in uh to encapsulate very briefly like both of my grandparents on my mother's side had the experience of we've lived in this these like rural ethnic villages for like hundreds of years like it's our whole family history is like we lived in these villages and then one day I mean, no, it wasn't one day. It was a gradual thing over time where a new government took over and then started to criminalize these people just for being people. So they were not allowed to be business owners anymore. Eventually, they were not allowed to keep their homes. And event- and then the, the cul- and they were not allowed to like marry other people from the society. And then eventually it was all like, and you're a disease. Like five to seven years into this campaign, you're vermin, you're a disease, we're going to ship you off and eliminate you from society. And it was like a slow process, but that they all lived through. And like every uh, intellectual and aristocrat and science person of that era and that community all agreed, all became to be in agreement with that position. Mm -hmm. Because over time, if you bombard people and repeat the same thing over and over again, you can move popular opinion where you want it to go yeah um so given that that's in my family history basically whenever i see anything that i consider to be a mob i almost always um instinctually just be like no i'm gonna be the person standing in the train tracks with this person (laughs) and like giving you know flipping the bird to the train that's coming kind of regardless of the reason why the train's coming or whether it's justified just because i know that People can err when they're in a mob, and the the IQ of a mob goes down the bigger that it gets. Yeah, there's less thoughtfulness. The more people that you know, even if it's the seedling of the idea is right, like we want to protect women in society, or we want social justice, or any of these like just on face kind of obviously good ideas. The more people that you have more fervently believing it, like more bad stuff kind of gets swept onto the oncoming train, kind of thing. Yeah, it's it's very much, uh, it's 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 so easy to rile people up, especially now. All it takes is one tweet, one post, one whatever, and then just boosting that uh, mm-hmm. for for the idea of that guy's bad, and we don't look at the why because that. It, um, there was a few years ago where I, I remember hearing about there is this woman. Uh, who was a doctor, and she was trying to research uh, pedophiles. She mm-hmm. was trying to figure out why, why do, why is there a cycle of pedophiles? Why do people do this, right? And she needed funding to do the research. Mm. But <laughs> I see where this is going. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but people didn't want to fund pedophilia. But it wasn't even it was it would have been a thing to stop pedophilia. Mm-hmm. But because the visual of it was, uh, we're paying to we're paying. For the help for for whatever you want to call it, the that stopped a lot of people, and then and then it became well, she was the one who did this. She wanted to uh, help research pedof- pedophiles, and so now now the attack goes on her instead of what the original objective was, which is to stop pedophilia. Yeah, this was before uh, social media fervor, but my old politics professor, Mark Roosevelt, grandson of Teddy Roosevelt, uh, he was running for the governor of Massachusetts, and he was trying to put forth one of these old school progressive policies of, we need job training in prisons, because when these these people get out of prisons, they need to have some vocational training. It you know All of the statistics say they're less likely to be a recidivist if they have job training, they can go into work. But then his opponent, William Weld, the Republican at the time, was just like, oh, so we're going to spend our tax dollar money giving it to prisoners <laughs> now? And then the whole, like, you know, Simpson-esque, like, audience blind is like, yeah, don't give my money to prisoners. <laughs> and it's like, everything we know says this is way more worth the money we spend than the money we spend on prisons themselves, like, yeah. in terms of improving our society. But... 
yeah, if you can get a soundbite saying something the other way, then everyone's like, no, you're supporting, you're taking money away from like my daughter's school and giving it to prisons or something. Like yeah, that. that should be me taking money from my daughter's school <laughs> so she can't read anymore. Exactly. Yeah. Um, you want to talk about your own personal experience with the uh, the standing in the train tracks and the train coming? Yeah, uh, metaphorically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think for me, it was a, a lot. A lot of my problems uh, kind of stem from like just saying the wrong thing to the wrong person. Mm-hmm. Like I, when I was younger, when I was in my twenties, I just would talk shit, right? Because I was like, oh, you know, not not even like on some I'm invincible kind of thing, but more of a you know, I, I, I can stand up for myself kind mm-hmm. of deal. The issue there is in a lot of people's eyes or a lot of people, what they heard or saw was, oh, black guy from Alabama, he should be dumb and happy to be here. Mm-hmm. And it should be that simple. He, The fact that he's getting opportunities or the fact that he is dating such and such or whatever, mm-hmm. he should be happy to be here instead of him wanting to rise or instead of him fighting back or saying this, that, the third. Uh, that's crazy. It's like it's almost like saying you should just be happy to be alive and don't ask for anything. <laughs> like that's pretty much yeah. That's kind of insane. Yeah, and it, and it's not that they vocalize that, mm-hmm. but you can. Again, I think they thought that I was stupid mm. because I'm, I'm 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 a hick from Alabama. Yeah. So the the idea was, oh yeah, that that guy is not. Oh now he's doing smart jokes or now he's he's singing on stage. He's doing this that there. He's doing improv and stand up uh, right. Um, so just pissing off the wrong people and granted, you know, making some bad decisions, but not like, not egregious to the point of where you have to go after me, right? Mm -hmm. Where, where it should be a thing that you bring up 10, 15 years later, that kind of deal. So wasn't the main thrust of it that you just had like a bad falling out with an ex? Yeah. And that, and that your ex decided to like make it a huge public thing for whatever reason. Yeah. So I, there was someone I dated for a couple of years Mm -hmm. and, and it, it it kind of, it just moved very fast. Mm -hmm. And I was coming off of what I would call my fuckboy phase. (laughs) Uh, cause I had been single for like a year and a half and I was doing well. I was skinny. I was, you know, I was like 24, uh, 24, 25, something like that. And, I uh, just kind of flushed into a relationship and, and it, it is not to, you know, no, no blame on her, but I, I think that I, I was able to kind of keep two separate, not keep, but I was doing two separate lives of like being, loving devoted boyfriend to person in the community Mm. but also still like kind of fucking around and then i would have other people in my ear like yeah man you're supposed to you're popular Mm -hmm. like that kind of thing uh so then once it kind of came to a head of me telling this person like yeah i'm i've cheated right uh then it became like and i i knew personally because she had told me a story of her uncle had cheated on her aunt and when the uncle cheated, the entire family cut him off. And mm-hmm. I was like... So this was, in other words, her programming. Yeah. This is her family programming, which is, A, it's a it's a particular trigger point for her. I mean, I'm sure it is for everybody. Nobody wants to be cheated on. But, like, right. it's a particular trigger point. And so this justifies her using, like, the nuclear option when dealing <laughs> with the boyfriend who's doing this. Because she's like, well, I already saw how my whole family, like, literally excommunicated one of our people in our family yeah. so this is the behavior that uh, that i will do now yeah like this you know and, and I, again I, i've been cheated on it, it does not, it's not fun oh yeah uh, my, my mom got cheated on you know and mm-hmm. and i think for me talking to so i, I had my and, and it's, it's again we talk about that that family dynamic but i had cousins and this person that person in my family or friends you know friends who were like yeah i've, I've fucked such and such wait like, but you're married to this person who who cares? It's like mm-hmm. so. I, so to me, it was like, well, if that person is my someone who I looked up to, or is this kind of father figure, is my whatever representative, and they're saying this action is okay, mm-hmm. then you justify it in your your head and your body of like, well, as long as I'm doing this safely, and as long as I'm not, you know, don't mess this up and muddle muddle this. Um, but then that got messed up and muddled. So it was like, okay, I'm seeing now the disconnect as I got older. Uh, of of like oh this isn't a good action right uh and that and because because they did something wrong because i did something wrong because whoever did something wrong that doesn't make them a bad person but i think when it is a community setting 
uh, you have to have a bad person. You have to have a bad guy, a villain. Mm-hmm. So it became, uh, <laughs> I was uh, I was told I was evil. I was told uh, I was a sociopath, a psychopath, uh, crazy. Uh, you know, you get, you get death threats, uh, all, that, all that stuff. Mm. And, um, and then I was like, okay, well maybe I'll, I'll, I'll quit comedy. I'll go to church. Right. And yeah. I d- did that. And then they were like, oh, now he's trying to rebrand himself as a Christian comedian. I was like, I've always, <laughs> what? I've, <laughs> I've talked about God before, like yeah. and going to church and stuff. But now I'm like, I'm, tr- I'm actively trying to do the right thing and like leave you know leave this person mm-hmm. alone and you know I, I got away from you why who are you still yeah. talking about me so it's almost like they're saying like no we've cast you as the villain in our community you can't not be the villain because then we have to find a new villain and that's like that's a pain yeah it's a lot of work well it, it be, and it became kind of a steady rotation that i picked up on and i think that's why people were like oh we can reach out to martin because he doesn't mind talking about it or whatever mm-hmm. um but it became kind of a steady rotation of Someone in the comedy world would die. We'd be sad for a week, and then we would kill somebody in the comedy community. <laughs> oh my god! Yeah, so that was just it was like this weird back and forth, and I was, yeah, and uh, and so this all happened in Chicago, right? Yeah, yeah, it was Chicago. And then via social media and like super motivated uh, crusaders on the internet. Uh, it started to bleed over when you came to LA to do comedy because people in the comedy community is like, no, he was our villain yeah. back then. So if you need one now, he's available. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Here's my headshot. Um, <laughs> right. But yeah, which was always weird because it was never... In, 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 it, it felt like this person's moved on, right? She's mm-hmm. doing her thing. I'm, I'm not going to go back there. I'm not going to, we're not going to talk, whatever. I've, I've sent my apologies. However they want to take it, they can take it. But that's, I've done everything I can mm-hmm. to work on me. You know, I've donated, donated the money. I've put in the time. I've, you know, did the therapy. I was on, so I, I literally lost my mind, right? I was going to kill myself, mm-hmm. right? I had a knife to my wrist. I was, uh, I was filming this sketch show for True TV mm-hmm. and, you know, got the call from my, uh, some people back home at the time and they're like, yeah, we can't da 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 da. Right. They uh, just, so they just canceled the thing in the middle of it or what? No, no, no. So it, I was just an extra on oh, this gotcha, thing. Gotcha. Uh, and I'm just, I, I was supposed to start writing for this TV show in New York mm-hmm. and, uh, and then they, they called me and they're like, yeah, we, we can't cause of what's happening with this. Right. Cause it was like in the, like in the middle of it. Mm-hmm. And I'm, I remember crying and being like, well, that's it. You gotta, there's no other option but suicide. Mm. And literally, as I had the knife to my wrist, my mom calls me mm-hmm. and tells me the story. Uh, like, she's, she's crying, right? And, mm-hmm. But two unrelated, like, cries. Mm-hmm. And she was saying she was driving uh, in Atlanta, I think on I-20, and there is a kid who was, like, I had to be in early 20s, but was sitting in the middle of the freeway trying to get hit by a car. And so it, like, stopped up traffic, mm-hmm. and people had pulled off to the side and, like, grabbed the kid to move them over to the side of the, uh, of the freeway. Right. And they're all, like, holding. The, and kid's like, no, I just want to, like, it's crying. I just want to die. I just want to die. And my mm-hmm. mom was, like, moved by this. And then she goes, how are you doing? <laughs> and Good timing. Yeah. And I, I go, I can't. I, I don't think I can do this. I, I can't. Mm-hmm. I can't get through this. And so then she's like, "If, if you if something happens to you, then I have no will to go on." Yeah. So a lot of it was like was like kind of a not even like a fight for survival, but like a thing of well, you know, I, I I've I've held myself back. I've mm-hmm. you know I've done everything I can do, and yeah. reali- realizing that some for some people that's just not. It doesn't matter. Like, yeah, it's, it's never like gonna... you pled your case to the community that did this, and they were very clear that like they didn't care about you as a person. They yeah. cared about you as the the symbol of this this crusade. And so whatever you did as a person is irrelevant to them. Yeah, and so just kind of hitting your head against a wall, trying to appeal to their better nature because maybe individually they have better natures, but as a collective, that doesn't exist. Yeah. Um. Well, that's good. I'm glad that you moved on <laughs> beyond trying to pander to them. Yeah, well, I it, it t- I remember there was um these two people who they sent me a they they kept like going after me on Twitter, right? 
and I sent them a fa- like a like in a message, like a group message to both of them on Facebook, and I was like, "Hey, why do you like we we only had positive interactions? Like I don't and I don't know you for real, for real. Mm-hmm. So what? Why is this something that you feel so? I'm not I'm not doing like that many shows. I'm not like." You know, I, I'm not working here. I'm not working there. I'm not doing this, that, the third. So what is it that this is supposed to do for you, right? Mm-hmm. And they didn't have an answer to that of like, why Why are you doing this instead of like, if, if there's someone, if, there, if, if it's this person who's like, I dated him and I hate him, right? right. And, I, and even then, like, I, I remember talking to uh, a past girlfriend and she was like, I hate you and you have to be okay with that. Mm-hmm. That's fine. Yeah, I and that and that'll that stings, that hurts. Like that's something I think about on a regular basis. Mm-hmm. But this person's not they're not actively like, well, how do I make sure he never uh feeds his family or like is able to live, right? Right. So it's like I don't you know, so I'll go, what what's your in like what do you want from this as someone who's not involved in any way, shape, or form. And they're like, oh, someone feels like he's getting bullied by the two queer kids. I'm like, that's not what I'm asking. Like, you yeah. ju- you, ju- you want you want to I mean, fight me on this. I feel like that's also kind of crazy making, which is when you make, like, a reasonable appeal mm-hmm. to an individual human being, and they're like, oh, no, we're not. There was never a conversation between two people happening. This is just, you know, this is how I score points online. So if you think that you're going to get an answer out of me as a, like, reasonable rational human being you're barking up the wrong tree um we were just reminded i was sorry i was just reminded of a another quote that i want to read to you Mm -hmm. again from the piece so you've been canceled you have to forgive people who called you out or said things about you you have to forgive people who never spoke to you personally who blocked you who went after your livelihood or family you have to forgive people who you loved who hurt you who you hurt most importantly you have to forgive yourself um, I imagine that that, you know, was a necessary part of coming back from the brink of all this stuff, but like, it still seems impossible to do. So how did you, how did you do that? Uh, <laughs> in, in, in some cases I haven't, uh, and I think that's something I'm still working on. Cause I, I do have like a lot of resentment. I, I'll, I'll look and think about where I, could have been Mm -hmm. but maybe i'm not supposed to be there maybe that wasn't the path that that i was supposed to be on um but a lot of it uh, for for a lot of it it's like realizing oh this person was miserable or this person was hiding their own deep dark secrets like they're it's it's interesting to look back now seven years Mm -hmm. and hear oh you know such and such was cheating on their girlfriend the whole time or this girl was cheating on her boyfriend the whole time or uh you know this girl raped this dude or Mm. this guy was like drugging people like you you find out all these things when you're when you're on the sides Mm -hmm. and kind of quiet and these were all members of the mob previously yeah Yeah. this person got arrested for x y so it's it's Mm -hmm. it was always crazy to kind of take a step back and see like everyone is hiding their own thing or everyone is trying to minimize their shit by amplifying yours Mm -hmm. and i I think for me like realizing like oh these are these aren't like big strong tough people because there there are a lot of times where i would uh just uh, like after a while i was like you know i'm going to talk to this person directly hey Mm -hmm. uh you said this uh what's up like what's going on Mm -hmm. and they would fold they would be because because i think it's so it's so easy online to Type something, get rid of it, and now you're just you're you're not you don't ha- you don't have to look someone in the eyes as you stab them in the stomach, mm-hmm. right? You it, it's easier to throw knife knife emoji knife emoji knife emoji on social media, especially so, if you're doing it behind like an anonymous avatar of some kind and not even like your real life identity. Yeah, yeah, but I guess even for people who are using their real name. It's performative. There's a lot of performative stuff that goes on online that if you go up to somebody's door, you know, you might break down that uh, veneer for a second and Mm-mm. get a real response out of them. Yeah. How do we solve for that? I mean, we're only spending more time on our phones. We're only spending more time in our filter bubbles. More of our interactions are online. Live theater seems to be dying in my experience. <laughs> I'm resisting it, but it's like people want to do everything online. So how do we fight against this trend of 
people's emotions and um, politics getting weaponized and and doing this to people. I say the best thing to do when you are about to tweet something that could be, and, and I know like Twitter has like now a new filter of like, hey, this is kind of this is a crazy thing you're about to say. You sure you want to do that? <laughs> <laughs> I think when when you when you start to type something, uh, or share a story, share an experience, or whatever, whatever that has the potential to affect someone or for them to see it. Number one, remember, anybody can see anything at any point. So there, someone will likely find that, right? If your goal is for that person to get help or get better, then reach out to them personally. And mm-hmm. it could be in a group setting. It could be whatever that you feel the safest, right? Do that. If your goal is, I don't want this person to have opportunities, uh, then also, you know, then then talk about your own experience. If it's not, if it has nothing to do with you, shut the fuck up. <laughs> I mean, it's so it's so simple. But I think uh, I think that's the that's the other thing is we we want everything to do with us. Mm-hmm. Uh, we want we want to be involved with everything. And sometimes it's okay to take a step back and be like, oh, that's not my community. So I'm gonna let whoever is the leader or whoever is directly involved, they can deal with that situation because that's their thing. That's mm-hmm. their fight. That's their crusade. I can cheer them on. I can support them, be it financially or mentally, emotionally, whatever. Uh, or, you know, and that's not the case of like people are dying or whatever, right? If it's something violent, then step in. But if it's like, if it's a thing of uh, just reputation destruction, then what, what, do you, what do you gain or benefit from participating in that? And you have to really step out of the sphere of your phone or your computer and ask yourself that. But also, like we, you know, we we had mentioned someone we know who is a big purveyor of that. Mm -hmm. And I remember, you know, uh, asking him because he loves just, yo, I hurt this thing. It's like, what does that do for you to to tell me? I don't know Mm -hmm. this person, and I don't give a shit. But why do you care so much? Do you feel like it? He feels like it's raising his own political capital because. I mean, I don't know. It's just juicy. It's just juicy to talk about somebody in the community who did a thing. Yeah. And you feel like you're gaining attention by doing it. But at the same time, you're making the right signal to the people you're talking to that like, well, I'm a good person, but here's what I heard about. Um, well, I, I think something that people forget is when you do that, you also end up holding a lens to yourself. So if you, so if someone hears, because that, that was another thing I told him, I was like, you know, if I if I went up to your ex girlfriend, the girl you lived with, and I asked her to tell me five things about you, how many of those things do you think would be nice? And he was like, I don't think any of them. Okay, so right now we've established that you might have been the abuser in a relationship, or you might have been the the aggressive one, or you yelled at her, or you threw something, or whatever, right? And especially if if she chose to find like five bullet points of the worst things that you did in a many year relationship, <laughs> it's not hard to crystallize that into something that sounds like you're a horrible person in the context of a tweet. Yeah, like easily. it's very easy <laughs> to to like dumb down and be so reductive that you're like, here are three things this person did. I'll just leave that there, and you're like, oh my god, yeah, it's a monster. Well. And then it's it, a it, human being. Yeah. And then you take away the, you know, 20, 30, 40 year experiences of this person, mm-hmm. uh, their their own traumas, their own upbringing, their own good deeds, their own like kindness, their own, you know, heart or whatever that could like, why does that not shape and mold who this person is with like, oh, they fucked up here or they mm-hmm. made this mistake or they didn't know this or this wasn't communicated properly. Mm-hmm. We we take that element of humanity away because, again, when you're when you're looking at a phone, it's cold. It's it's hard. You don't have to worry about the dead body that's on the other side of it because you're like, well, that person's dead already. So I can move on. I think that you really you've really hit the core of the issue, which is just what we're talking, this phenomenon of canceling or whatever you want to call it is ultimately dehumanizing a person because you can't effectively cancel somebody if you empathize with them as a person and what they've gone through. Yeah. Even if it's like a legitimately horrible person, like, yeah, you know, you'll find a reason to try to rehabilitate them or to help them somehow if you empathize. But yeah, is, is this just this, tendency towards dehumanization is this just something because we're all 
collectively being dehumanized all the time because we're giving more and more of our personalities to the social media sphere. We're giving more and more of our time to these devices. We're lending our memory to our phones. You know, we don't have phone numbers. Is it like, are we being dehumanized and therefore it's easy for us to single out and ostracize somebody and dehumanize them? Do you think those things are related? I think so. And I, I think even beyond that, we we dehumanize ourselves in our like, like personally, like I, you know, even me, I'm like, I, there, there are days I wake up and I'm like, why did you say, why did you talk shit to that girl? <laughs> like, you know, or what, you know, what did, you, you could have been nicer to this person or whatever. Right. Uh, and, you, and when you, or, or even, even beyond that, ah, oh, you're, I'm, you're too fat or your, your head's small. Like I, like recently my whole thing is like, I'll look in the mirror if I'm wearing like a jacket and I feel like I look like the Koopa Troopers from the Super Mario Brothers movies with John Leguizamo. Uh-huh. And I'm like, why do I think that? Why do I? Why am I tearing myself down? Uh, and then that's going to amplify for other people. So I think we, as soon as we wake up, our first thing is to dehumanize and hate ourselves. And especially now we have this like body positivity kind of like rah-rah thing. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, like the reason people have to do that is because there's those internal voices of like, you realize you're fat, right? And you're like, no, no, but my fat is beautiful or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, so we have that. And then you go on. And then if, as soon as you say my fat is beautiful, you go online and see like, you know, super someone super skinny and super hot with a great butt and this, that, the third. And, uh, and then you have to contend with that. And then you get angry and you look for, well, why do I? I don't look like this person, but I bet this person is hiding something. And then and then you just you, you go to tear down something so you feel better. So mm-hmm. I feel like if we if we bridge the gap of and, and you know I don't it's not like phones and the internet's going to disappear but I think what we have to do is kind of bridge that gap of how we can make ourselves happy how we can heal our own past traumas and past uh, you know relationships deterrences but also be honest with ourselves of if the shoe is on the other foot and someone found out about the skeletons in my closet what, what you know how would how would I regard their reaction should I should I be the one to do the same thing that I wouldn't want done to me? So like mm. the golden rule, he who casts the first stone. Um, I feel like there's a lot of meat left on the bone, but I think we've come up to our, our time limit. So Martin, thank you so much for being a part of this. I'd love to have you back and talk more about the meme verse <laughs> and how we can manipulate it or how it's manipulating us. But uh, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Till uh, till part two. Till part two. This is AI Affected, where we talk about human relationships and algorithms and how the two can get along. Do I say anything? No, I think we're good. Oh. <laughs> I think we're out. Oh. Thanks, man. Thank you. Yeah, I know that we're bleeding over into the next. Uh, the next time slot, but... Yeah, did I surprise you by, like, reading your quotes back to you and stuff? I wasn't expecting that. <laughs> I like to, uh, I prefer to not know anything and just say, yeah, whatever, whatever. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I do my homework. <laughs>